Greetings and Shabbat Shalom. Last week I uh, gave a talk where I talked about uh, a prophecy that I believe began to unfold from 604 BC all the way uh, to 1917. And uh, sometime after that 604 date, actually in 520 BC, Haggai gave a prophecy, which I said related to that. Then I also talked about a prophecy that Ezekiel gave on April 28th of 573 BC and projected uh, seven biblical times uh, from that period all the way to 1948. And uh, I hope that um, those of you who heard that talk were not having difficulties with following it in terms of the concept of a biblical time and seven times and the number of years and the you know, number of days rather in, in that period of time and, ref and then of course the principle and prophecy of a day for a year and I hope that it wasn't uh, it wasn't too complicated of a talk. Uh, what what are you telling me? You're wondering what I'm talking about? You didn't hear the talk? Where were you? Go back and listen. Today I want to cover, of course, a different subject, and I want to begin by going to uh, Matthew 26. And uh, here we see Peter <laughs> trying to deny his relationship to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ grew up in Galilee, and uh, his disciples were Galileans, and here they were in the south. <laughs> they were in Jerusalem. Uh, it kind of reminds me of when I was in Mississippi, in south, southern Mississippi, at a family reunion. And I sat down across from some woman, and she said to me, you sound like you come from north of the Pennsylvania line. <laughs> and indeed, that's true. Uh, and this is what happened with Peter. Uh, verse 72 of Matthew 26. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you, are, you, are, you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Oh, you sound like a Galilean. His speech betrayed him. Today I want to talk about Christian language. There's various languages in the world, thousands of them. But whatever language you speak, if you're a Christian, you should be speaking Christian language. You know the old saying, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, one way you're going to be convicted is the way you speak. Now, obviously, actions speak louder than words, but words are important in terms of how we communicate with people in a consistent way, day after day, month after month, year after year. Here you see Peter was identified as a Galilean by his speech. <clears throat> I want to go to Judges 12. Here you see another example of people who, whose speech uh, showed them up for what they were. Uh, Judges 12 and verse 6. Here there's a conflict between those on the east bank of the Jordan River and elements of the uh, tribe of Ephraim. <clears throat> and uh, in verse... Uh, Five of uh, Judges 12, the Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. And when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, then they would say to him, then say Shibboleth. Now Shibboleth would mean some term that kind of a, a concept or an idea that identifies a group, particularly if they're trying to move away from it. Shibboleth evidently means a flowing stream. Uh, or at least that's one idea about it. Then they, they, they would say to him, then say Shibboleth, and he would say Sibboleth. Oh, you see, some languages don't have the sh sound. It comes out as an S. I think, that's, I think that's the situation in Greek, which is why in Hebrew we say Shabbat, but now it came to us as Sabbath from Greek to Latin and into the, uh, into the Western languages and so on. Um, also, you know, the, here we have the tribe of Ephraim. There's the tribe of Manasseh. But in Hebrew, it's Menashe. But in English, it's Manasseh. 
So that was the problem here. Instead of saying shibboleth, they would say sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they would take him and kill him at the fords of the Jordan. There fell at that time 42,000 Ephraimites. So there, the, your accent uh, meant your life in that situation. There's um, another example of that in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, towards the end of the Old Testament, uh, if we go to the book of Nehemiah, and uh, I have a problem between orders of books, but uh, here I go. Uh, Numbers 13. As you know, there's a different order in the Tanakh than in the, in the New King James translation. Anyway, I'm going to Nehemiah 13 and verse 23. Uh, in those days, this is Nehemiah 13, 23, I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Here were Jews. They were supposed to be maintaining the Sinaitic covenant. And here they were marrying pagan women. Idolatrous women. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. Now, I would, I would have to say, I'm not sure specifically what language at this point was the language of Judah. They were still keeping records in, in Hebrew, uh, but at the same time, there, there was material available in Aramaic by this time. And uh, in any case, they had their way of speaking Aramaic. It would have been Judeo-Aramaic. It would have been the Aramaic of the Jews with, with a lot of Hebrew terms and just an accented the way the Jews of that day and time accented. On the other hand, the other peoples of Ashdod and Ammon and Moab would have been speaking their version of the language, such as, you, you know, even today. You know, you can tell a person who's, who's from the great United Kingdom versus somebody from, from the United States uh, yeah, just, or somebody from Australia versus somebody from the United States. And there's, some, you know, it's like Winston Churchill said, I think, about the Americans and the British. There are people uh, uh, divided by a common language, I think is how he put it. So uh, whatever it was, whether they were speaking Hebrew and the others were not, or they were speaking Judeo-Aramaic Judeo and the others were not, it, there was a definite distinction. And what did that show? That showed that they were assimilating into the culture of their mothers, their pagan mothers, and that's a very serious problem, you know, because we want them to be, to be uh, pre preserving, carrying on the, the uh, God's way of life and not uh, assimilating it to paganism. And so he was quite uh, severe about this. Uh, verse 25, so I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them and pulled out their hair and, and made them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, you know, going back to Deuteronomy 7, and it's not a racial matter. It's, it's a matter of, of, of these were pagan. No, it didn't matter. It was, this is not a racial issue. It's a spiritual issue. You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons uh, or yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him to sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil transgression, uh, uh, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? So here again, the language of these children showed that they were losing their connection to God's way of life. Again, we have the issue of, of language showing what kind of person that you are. And let's go to Matthew, the 12th chapter. We used to have an expression regarding the computer, gigo, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. You know, you, you feed it incorrect data, so, you know, botched results come out. Matthew 12 and verse 34, speaking to the Pharisees, he says, brood of vipers. This is Matthew twelve thirty four. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We have what we call in English a Freudian slip. That is to say, you say something, 
by mistake, but it reveals your true feelings, a Freudian slip. So we are going to be identified by how we speak, and we should be speaking Christian language. People should somehow know that, that, that we're maintaining certain standards by our language. Now, I'm not talking about being self-righteous. I'm not talking about um, throwing words around, you know, biblical terms it's in order to sound religious. That's also a, um, um, that's certainly not something that you'd want to do. Um, it, 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 it actually gives a false impression. It gives the impression that in order to be, you know, a, a commandment keeper, you've got to use artificial terms that others don't use. It makes you peculiar in an offensive way. We are to be a peculiar people, but not peculiar in terms of odd or offensive. We're to be a people whom others would, would say, well, I may not agree with his religion, but as a person, he's, he's quite a good person. Now, what kind of speech, therefore, should we have? Well, obviously, when we speak, we, we should be honest. People should say, you know, what he says is reliable. We can trust him. He keeps his word, and, he, and also he doesn't spread false information. Nor is he malicious in his words. You know, there, there, there's verses about that in Psalm 34. Uh, I may have time to get to it. I may not, because this is a vast subject. But the point is that, you know, are we using speech as a weapon? You know, in America, we have a folk song about the West. People want to be out on the prayer, uh, out uh, home on the range, where seldom is heard a discouraging word. How about when we speak? When we speak, I hope seldom is heard a discouraging word when we speak. Because it, we don't want to use words as weapons to tear people down. We want to rather build people up. As I said, this is a vast subject. I want to go to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18 and verse 21. Now, I heard a very nice, fine talk uh, by a minister uh, in around the area of Tampa. I live in Central Florida, and I was attending a, a service around ta the Tampa area, and the minister said, you know, more or less, let's face it. Most of us, if we've gotten in trouble, it's because we've shot our mouth off, you know, it's because of things that we said. We, we often, you know, cause a lot of harm to people and also cause, have a, a, a lot of self-inflicted harm by what we say. So we do have to be careful. Uh, you know, I've, I've often said uh, what I read years ago, that it's, it's wonderful to be able to speak many languages. It's, also, it's even more important to be able to keep one's mouth shut in one language. Uh, in Proverbs 18.21, there is a time, of course, in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're told there's a time to speak and a time, time to keep silent. So we have to have wisdom. When we pray to God, we pray for wisdom, hopefully. <laughs> and when we, as we pray for wisdom, we should have the wisdom. You know, one, one, one thing we want to know is when, when to speak and when to keep silent. That's one thing we have to apply. In Proverbs 18, verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So if you, if you uh, consider speech a precious thing, to, and, you're, and you're careful about your speech, then... There, there, there are great benefits uh, to be had. Proverbs 25 and verse 11. Proverbs 25 and verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. If someone has done a good job, tell that person. You know, and, and if somebody is, is making progress, encourage that person. Uh, it, this is very important, especially in, in, in how we deal with our children, how we deal with our employees. As I said, it's a vast subject. We are told in the Ten Commandments, you know, in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, that we are uh, not to take... Uh, the the name of God in vain. And that's what I was talking about earlier. If we're all, always throwing around religious-sounding language, we could be taking God's name in vain. Uh, you know, we could be uh, 
attributing to God our own uh, notions or or just um, random things that are allowed to happen, as it says in Ecclesiastes 9:11. Time and chance. Ha- well, I'll, I'll 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 since I'm near there, I happen to be in the Psalms, and so Ecclesiastes is not far away. So I'm going to go to Ecclesiastes 9:11. Um, and I, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. Sometimes a, te- a team is lucky enough to win. They may not be the best team on paper, but they somehow, you know, that one day they managed to put together a victory. Anyway, it says here, The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Now, as I said, we're not to take God's name in vain. And this is in some ways a little thing to some people. But you understand that Jesus said that we're not to take, uh, for, we're, we're not to uh, dismiss even the, the, the what we might consider the smallest of his commandments, the le- maybe the least significant to us. Maybe we don't consider it important, as significant perhaps as obviously as stealing or murdering, you know, or, or, or lying. Uh, but he still says uh, he's not going to hold you guiltless if you take his name in vain. It, it may not be a big deal to you, but you have to have reverence for God's name and respect for God and and be God-fearing. Imagine the difference in society if people really had a great respect for God's name, an awe for God's name, and we didn't hear all the time uh, his name taken in vain or various euphemisms uh, for that. And uh, don't think it doesn't have to do with speaking. It has obviously more to do with speaking than the two. It has to do with just doing things in God's name that are wrong, and therefore you bring in effect disrepute on, on the God of the Bible. If you misbehave and yet claim to be doing it, you know, for the sake of God, then this is what we call in Hebrew, Achil Hashem. You've desecrated the, the, the name of God. But notice in, in Psalm 139 and verse 20, it says, For they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take in vain. Yeah, wait, of course, take your name in vain. And so you see that speaking wickedly is connected to taking uh, God's name and uh, taking God's name in vain. So yes, it does have repercussions beyond speaking, but it ought to be it ought to be involved I- as well in our speaking. That is to say, a Christian should should be the kind of person that's not taking God's name in vain, and also in general is not cursing and using what we would call in in, in English foul language, bad language. Uh, some people should notice about you that you don't use that kind of language. You know, now maybe. As I said, they may think if they hear hear about your religious practices that they seem odd to them, but at least they'll respect the fact that when, you know that they don't hear bad language out of you. And as I said, they'll respect the fact that you don't put them down and and um, and uh, you're not malicious in your speech. They'll and they'll notice that when they've done a good job, you 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 acknowledge it. You're not so so puffed up about yourself that that you feel like somehow you're diminishing yourself by recognizing the talents of other people some people they seem they're so sensitive about their own status that they don't want to recognize the talent of other people that's of course uh, very foolish because none of us is going to get very far on his or her own whatever talent you may have and you may be one of the greatest talents in the world in in some field but there may be other fields in which you are totally incompetent you know, even the greatest genius in one area may be totally incompetent in another area. All of us need each other. We need one another. So I want to uh, go on to uh, to the book of James, where a lot is said on this. Uh, I've said before, James is like uh, Ecclesiastes and Proverbs uh, from the New Testament perspective. And he does have a lot to say about, about speaking. Uh, and in uh, James uh, 3 and verse 1 is a verse that's very scary for people like me. Uh, but he says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So obviously, what I'm telling you today, <laughs> I have to tell myself. Um, 
For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to uh, bridle the whole body. And then he talks about <laughs> the fact of the tongue and all the problems that the tongue can cause. And as I said, Proverbs 34, uh, Psalms 34 talks about it, and Peter in his writings uh, repeats that. Uh, maybe I will turn to that. Um, I'll turn to Psalm 34, and, and, and many of you know that, that Peter uh, quotes it early, uh, later. Um, I'm, in, I'm in verse 12. Uh, who, who is the man who desires tw a life? Proverbs 34, uh, Psalms 34, 12. And loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You know, seek peace and pursue it would mean that in your day-to-day -day speaking, you don't antagonize people. Verse, Proverbs 15 and verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. So let's be wise in what we say, and let's not deliberately provoke people. Let's not be, let's, as I said, not use words as weapons. And I'll say something else. Sooner or later, we're, we're, we might be in an argument. And what's more important, to win an argument or to lose a friend or to even alienate a spouse? It may be better, you know, life is not a contest where you're keeping score. Uh, you know, years ago, there were these beach movies that maybe some of you saw in your youth and maybe you still watch them. You know, these uh, Frankie and Annette movies and... Uh, he would he would he would make a point, and they would say, "Yeah, there would be a crowd gathered around them as they had this quarrel." And he would make a point. Maybe the men would say, "Yeah, yeah," and then she would make a point, and the women would say, "Yeah, right on." Okay, you know. But is is that what life is? Is it a contest where you score points and you want to always be the winner in an argument? You know, you want to win an argument and maybe lose a friend. There may be a time to just back off and not 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 continue to pursue it. Uh, rather than just try to get in that, you know, you know, hit the jugular and make, you know, and, and, and win the point. You know, they're more important things than whether or not you've won an argument. Uh, anyway, I want to, I want to finally go back to James and um, in verse three of James three, indeed, we put bits in horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. You know, when you can take a powerful animal like a horse and control the horse. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, but they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pillar desires. I'm sorry, wherever the pilot desires, the pilot who's driving the, uh, the, the, uh, the ship, the boat, you know, he can take the rudder and direct the entire ship. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a force a little fire kindles. You know, just the wrong word can really stir up a lot of strife, can stir up a lot of problems. And by the way, it, it, although James talks about the tongue as, as a little member, but in, an, in one sense, that, you know, it's interesting. The tongue evidently is quite, quite complex from the point of view of muscles. There are, from what I understand, a lot of muscles in the tongue. It's interesting. It's small, but, but complex, evidently. And, and uh, he, so James has a lot to say about that. Now, it's interesting. In Jewish tradition, uh, the Yom Kippur, uh, Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement, is a time when Orthodox Jews are 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 praying all day, virtually all day long, and uh, they have a confessional that they recite, and they they pound their chest and they recite as a community, we've done this and we've done that and we've done this and we've done that. And what's interesting is how many of the sins involve wrong use of the tongue. Uh, it, that's very quite significant. Anyway, verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a, wor a, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. So, that, you know, now obviously the tongue is very positive too, as I showed you earlier in Proverbs. It works both ways. We have to have the wisdom to use, it, uh, use, use language appropriately. 
for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But the, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly uh, evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so ought not to be so. Now coming up in the middle of this month, we're on the 13th day of the 11th month on the sacred calendar. And the 15th day of this month uh, is the uh, time when in uh, Jewish tradition, the uh, records were kept for tithes regarding the produce of trees. Uh, you know, the new year for the for the tithing on trees is the 15th day of the 11th month. That's when the heavy rains uh, recede, and then you have the lighter rains. It's a kind of early spring. It's when the almond trees begin to, 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 uh, to, to blossom. Uh, the almond trees, the early blossoming tree are the almond trees, and they begin to blossom on the 15th day of the 11th month. Hamisha Asar Bishvat, or Tu Bishvat. So it's Jewish Arbor Day, and um, planting of trees is very important among Jews. And, you know, the uh, Jewish National Fund, Keren Kayemet Yisrael, uh, ha has been actively working for, for uh, decades and decades to reforest the land of Israel. I noticed recently our president, uh, President Trump, talked about a project of planting a trillion trees. So uh, trees are very important, and we understand that, uh, you know, by, their, by your fruits, you know, by the fruits, you know the tree, as, as we know from, from the Gospels. And uh, he, here, here James says, you know, that if, 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 if you have a, 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 a well, I'll, just read, I'll just read how he puts it. Uh, verse 11, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? You know, so the fruit of the tree tells you what kind of tree it is. And so if you're spewing out negative talk, if you're, you know, spewing out mal malicious words, what does it say about your, your inner being? What kind of tree are you? You know, if your fruit is bitter, what kind of tree are you? Can a spring... Uh, does a spring uh, uh, send forth fresh water and, and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So he's trying to say that, you know, our inner being ought to be such that what comes out of us, you know, when we speak, you know, is, is, is something that is upbuilding, edifying, constructive. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a time for criticism. There isn't a time for righteous indignation. You know, you, you see how God's prophets rebuked uh, the people of Israel at, uh, when, when it was appropriate, and how Paul even criticized Peter, a fellow apostle, when it was appropriate. So there is a time for criticism, but it has to be done in a spirit of love. Uh, let's go on to verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And, of course, as I said, obviously, we don't just talk to talk, we walk to walk. But we have to begin by talking to talk. That's step one, you know. And talking to talk is part of right conduct. Talking is also conduct. So, as I said, our speech ought to let people know, whatever they may think about our religion, but they ought to let people know that we're the kind of people that they would want to be around. They wish that everybody, in a way, spoke, spoke as we, d we do. They wish that, that everybody uh, was not vicious in, in, in speech, that everybody wasn't sarcastic, that everybody wasn't dishonest, and so on and so on. You know, and as I said, they, they, they may think, wow, he sure has unusual customs and holidays he celebrates or what he eats or doesn't eat. But at the same time, they would say, well, this person, as a person, I, you know, I wish everybody could, you know, could uh, be that kind of person. And, uh, you know, it says, in, I'm going to go to Matthew 5, and it talks about our works there. But what we say is also part of our works, what, you know, how we speak. But in Matthew 5 and verse 14, uh, in Matthew 5 and verse uh, 14, 
Uh, let's go to the 16th verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So it doesn't say, uh, let them see your good works and become members of the church. It says, let them see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we should be the kind of people that others thank God for. If they, if they are people that pray, you know, they should say, you know, thank God that so-and-so is my friend. Thank God that so-and-so works for me. Thank God that so-and-so is my boss. That's the kind of people we ought to be. And, of course, it begins with what, with, with our, with what we say. That's, that's step one. Obviously, we have to follow through with, with what we do. And if what we do and what we say are not consistent, then what are we? Hypocrites. And we surely don't want to be hypocrites. Uh, I want to uh, conclude uh, by going to the book of Colossians. I remember attending a a uh, a seminar, what perhaps you could one could call it, or a, or a lecture, a session uh, where an evangelist was speaking about just this subject about speaking properly, and he quoted uh, Colossians four and verse six. Colossians four and verse six, and uh, here is what Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. He says, "Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt." that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So we, we need to come before God and, and pray that our words are, 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 are positive in the sense that they are making this world a better place. If our language would be compared to a meal, then that meal ought to be a delicious meal because we're speaking Christian language. All the best to you and yours.